this week's episode of the Designer Roundtable, we're actually going to start talking about pricing your work. Now, all of us as a group, we've collectively seen some designers recently pricing their work, and some of us feel that they're not getting enough for their work in terms of like what they're worth and what their skill sets are. So this is kind of going to be maybe a little bit of a guide for you guys to try to figure out how to price your work and you know what's considered when to start pricing your work and how to do it. So this time we're also joined by creative media director at Truex Management, Emily Butler. So she's going to offer some of the, she works for uh, the Truex Management Group. So she's on the business side of it. And while these four guys, um, you know, Harris is with NASCAR, SM, uh, Sean has SMD, Ryan has his designs, and so does Kyle. So we have a kind of a good uh, spectrum, if you will, when it comes to pricing. So just, Emily, I want to start with you. When it comes to pricing your work, I mean, when did you start realizing when you were a freelancer, when was a good time to start pricing your work? Was it in high school? Was it in college? You know, like, what was your time frame? So I actually started pricing my work after my first internship in college. And for me, that was as a freshman. Um, so it just kind of depends when you get your first outside experience, I think is the right time. Of course, in order to start pricing your work, you do have to, you know, get that experience. But I think it's good once you have that experience, when you've had a client, whether it was family, friends, uh, maybe you've had a mentorship. I think that's a really good time to start. And, you know, it just kind of shows once you're building your resume, I think once you have something to put down on that resume, that says that you're credible, that says that you're learning. Um, so definitely as a freshman, sophomore in college. I mean, I, I was going to say, you know, there's some people in this in the industry that, that haven't gone to college or, or aren't going to go to college. You know, they, may, they might be self-taught. They might be, you know, they might have picked up a copy of Photoshop when they were 13 because the way computers have advanced since, you know, even her and I were in college, these, these kids can jump on and learn this stuff super mm -hmm. quick. Um, so, but like she said, you know, once you get your first bigger opportunities, once you get your, your big breaks, um, it, it's time to start thinking about, you know, how much of your time you're spending and, and how much, uh, how much is worth to you. Um, e even if you, you haven't gotten gone to college, you don't have that degree. If you're doing higher level stuff, um, it's time to look and, and, and see what it takes to put some money in your pocket and, and make your time worth it. Definitely. And I, I definitely feel like, um, you know, I was definitely self-taught for the most part, but um, I, def I went to community college here in Raleigh, and I will say that I learned so many things, not to get too off topic, but I learned a lot of things uh, that I definitely thought I already knew uh, and stuff like that. Um, but I definitely started, was able to charge um, out of college, you know, pretty decent prices for things because I had the degree. Um, we had to do a portfolio project that I really, I, I probably worked harder on that than anything in all of my entire school career. Um, and, you know, having that and, and, uh, and the degree really also helps to show people and, and allows you to, to get the kind of pricing and, and that you deserve for, for the type of job that this, you know, requires. Yeah, and pricing, it's one of the toughest things about doing freelance. I think all of us, you know, have, have been there and have learned, you know, along the, along the way. I've been freelancing since I graduated college in, uh, what, 02? So it's been a while. Um, so it's, uh, you know, I've had like 20 years of, of freelancing and, and, you know, able to, to, you know, work an agency job. And that's currently what I do now. I work as a, an art director at an agency here in Akron. And, um you know, I did do freelance on nights and weekends, uh, you know, pursuing your passion. That's a big thing is a lot of, a lot of freelancers are pursuing full-time gigs like Ryan, you know, it, he made the, made the jump and, you know, it's scary and exciting at the same time, but uh, you learn a lot along the way about yourself, uh, what, what your time is worth. That was one of the big things I had to, I had to figure out what is your time worth, you know, because I, I have four young kids, so they, they demand all of my time if they could. And, so I try to, you know, I try to figure out, hey, you know, if this is going to take me away from my family, you know, it's got to be worth something. And what is that amount? And then you, you figure that out over time. So, I, you know, I've, I've went into things overcharging and they come back to, no, that's, that's too much. And then I've undercharged a lot of times and even have done some stuff for free. But one of the biggest things that I learned as a freelancer, and I'll, I'll try to make it real quick, um, was the charge of deposit. And I know we were kind of chatting about this, uh, you know, along the way. Um, 50% of the lowest estimated value or the estimated amount. So if you give a range, just 50% of that lowest, it's kind of where the, you know, the client 
meet you halfway. Uh, they're not putting all their trust in you. You're not putting all your trust in them. You're kind of going halfway. And so it's kind of a relationship, a business relationship from the start, and it covers both parties. So you both have some skin in the game and you're able to, you know, move forward from there and everyone's committed. So um, that, that would be one big thing I would recommend for sure. So when it comes to um, the free work that you mentioned, Sean, so there's a lot of members in the NASCAR design community as a whole on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. They're cranking out concept paint schemes. Uh, I know a couple uh, members in particular that have actually done some work behind the scenes with some teams. I don't know if they charged them. My guess is they didn't. But tell me a little bit of how, how does free work hurt the value of the job as a designer? Well, for those of us who are charging for the work uh, that are professionals in the industry, uh, you know, we, we've worked our way into where we're at now. You know, we did, we, along the way, we've gotten our lucky break and have had cards fall our way in the past and, you know, have, have worked longer on things just to get in, you get your foot in the door. Um, but when designers come out and totally give things away for, for free, um, you know, it, uh, it, it causes the, the people who are, you know, paying for their services to be undervalued at that point. And, you know, with, with the explosion of iRacing and anyone can just jump on and whip together a paint scheme and it looks awesome rendered on track. Um, what they don't understand is the, all the back work that goes into actually laying these things out in a five point template to get this stuff approved by NASCAR and, and to push it to the wrap companies and to have it actually executable. Um, that's a big thing. You can, you can design an RGB all day long. Uh, and then when it comes time to, you know, the, the clients approved it, great. Well, now you have this really complex digital design that you're going to have to figure out how to get into a, a format that the wrap company is going to be able to actually produce. Um, so that, that could get, that could get them in trouble. And a lot of these guys they're coming up, don't understand that um, just because they haven't ever been in that situation and know all that goes into having a relationship with a race team and doing the work for the, you know, what appears on track. You know, I think, uh, you know, for me, got, kind of going off of what Sean was saying, I, my situation was really unique, I think, um, to a lot of other freelancers. I was really fortunate enough to win uh, some, some really big contests that I owe a lot uh, to my success and the opportunities that I've been given. Um, but in turn, that, that made it very difficult for me to understand um, what to charge. Because I think at one point I was like, I don't care how long this takes me. I don't care how much time I pour into this. I want to see one of my designs on track, whatever that takes. And then you realize um, people will take advantage of you. And people will you know, kind of assume that that work is free. And um, I think that there just comes a point where you have to realize your self-worth and your self-value. And the, like, you know, what Sean was saying, time is priceless. You know, you, your time is very valuable. And a lot of the times, you know, yeah, you're, you're charging for um, your final product, which, you know, all of us create outstanding work and, and the final product is going to be great, but it's, it's also the time that we put into it. And, you know, I think all of us, aren't in the business of ripping anyone off. You know, it's, it's whatever is going to be fair for both of us um, while, you know, still making money and, and, and being valued for that. So, you know, there is a, there's a fine line, but, um, and I know a lot of designers out there would just do anything they could to see their paint scheme on track one time. But, um, you know, at some point there, there does come a point where you have to charge for your work and know that you are valuable for it. I mean, branching off what he said, uh, you know, I feel like I think we all entered at least one of those contests you won. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, after, after the most recent contest I participated in, I'm uh, extremely against contests with designers. Uh, most contests, you, know, <laughs> you, you retweet, you do something like that, and it's no work. You know, you do, you, you tag somebody, you retweet, you know, and you might win a t-shirt. Well, yeah. The design contest, the company is essentially taking advantage of a bunch of young, naive designers that I have been quite a few times. Um, and they get a, a whole breadth of free work for nothing. And they whittle it down. And at the end of the day, I feel like it, it whittles down our importance and our um, reputations a little bit. Not, not, at the, not that we entered, but as graphic designers as a whole, it kind of devalues some of our, some of the work that goes into it, some of the time that it takes. Cause 
I know as excited as I was for all those contests, I went in and went all out. I mean, I illustrated an entire hot dog out of a car. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I got Which looked great. <laughs> and, you know, the winner and it didn't look like they had spent quite as much time as I had. And I ended up, you know, sitting there with an empty hot dog in my hand. And, uh, I'm eating the bun for me. Wow. But uh, <laughs> it's a DW reference or what? Yeah, nice. That one out. Design, young designers should be wary of contests. Contests are a way to make huge breaks. Like Kyle has, has just rocketed off of the platform that they've given him. And honestly, I lost hands down to him in, in the nationwide contest. He was, his was far and above mine. Right. Um, but uh, it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a weird balance there because those things, you know, other companies see those things and they're like, oh, well, we can get, you know, 400 free pink schemes and see what sticks. And um, it, it's, it's a weird line. It's a weird rope to, to toe. Um, but on top of that, you know, just like looking at, at the opportunities, looking at, at what it might mean to you. Um, I, I know myself included, we're all doing stuff that at, at one point in our life, even now we would probably do for free. Uh, you know, it, we're, we're living our dream. We're making cars reality. We're making NASCAR a better looking place. Um, and, and at the heart of it, you know, even if, you know, it came to where I couldn't get paid, I would still want to do it. But having a life, having things to pay for, having bills, having priorities, um, it, you really have to take those into account. Like, you know, is the time worth it? And like you said, with your, with your four kids, you got to make sure it's worth it for you. Yeah, I think so. This is something that he and I talk about a ton is, you know, he'll be sitting there knocking out this beautiful, like you said, hot dog car. And I mean, the whole time I was like, you should have mustard, you should have this. Because me as a, as a creative also, I'm always like, you should do this, you should do that. Hey, you forgot that. Um, so it's a lot of fun to go back and forth. But I think with the whole contest thing, it's really hard because companies see it as a way to not necessarily take advantage of designers. But I mean, essentially, that's what they're doing. And Young designers, it's really, it's really, I guess, just awesome to see it and you want to support it and you want to do it and it's so hard to say no, but at the same time, you can't make a living off of that and that's really hard and that's something that he and I have talked about. I mean, his whole idol was Sam Bass and Sam did so many beautiful things, but I, I guarantee he should have been so much more recognized and I always tell Ryan, it's I always I just read Ryan on the screen. Whoa. <laughs> Whoa. 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 Cut that. Cut that. <laughs> anyway, but it's definitely hard to tell Harris that, you know, don't overdo it. Don't spend so much time on it because you're really spending all the time where you could be making money. And yeah, it's, it's tough. Extremely hard to balance that passion with that, hey, you need money in your wallet. Well, and I think all of us like here. Uh, you know, to Emily's point there, I I've been told that by my fiance, hey, you don't spend so much time on that. It's almost impossible if, because all of us take so much pride in our work, whether it's free or it's for a million dollars, I'm going to put as much effort into it as, as I can, I think. And that's the biggest thing. And I think the last thing about the contest thing is, and I agree with, um, you know, looking back, yeah, th those, are, those are times that I spent countless hours that I could have been getting paid, but I chose to take the route where, you know, I'm from Wisconsin. There, there was no chance of me working for NASCAR. That's just never been in the cards for me. It's not realistic. Um, I, I, turned, I took this opportunity to try to make a name for myself or these opportunities and, and it worked. I think, um, you know, I'm, I'm super lucky for that. Um, you know, but then there comes a time when you have to say, okay, you know, like, People know who I am. Uh, people know what my work is, and now it's time to, you know, kind of make a, a little bit of a living off this and, and make some money. And um, you know that that's a tough time because you you want to do everything for free and you want to be able to please every one of your clients. And um, you know those there's going to be those tough conversations where you're saying, hey, I'm going to need a little more money or or you know might have to up my rates or whatever it is. So again, it goes back to just really understanding your value and what you bring to the table and um you know just just knowing that everyone is is worth um the the money and the time that you put in definitely and like 
it's been said a, a bunch of times, but it's obviously time consuming and meticulous. And, uh, you know, it'd be impossible to make a living doing design work if everybody expected free work and stuff. And, and even going past free work, just doing really cheap work, uh, there are a lot of instances where if you do the math, you might not even make close to minimum wage. Uh, you know, when you, when you, t when you factor in how much time you might've spent versus what you, uh, um, what you, uh, charge. Um, but it's like, you know, you, uh, you just, you can't make a living that way ever. And, uh, you really just have to, uh, make people understand the, the type of value that, uh, and, and time that goes into designing and things like that. I think that, you know, to touch on all you guys' points about uh, contests, you know, like I got, you know, I, I've really, I've got some great coverage from entering a few contests, you know, Kyle and, uh, you know, Harris, I think we're all, we were all in that same nationwide contest. And it was great exposure for all of us. And, uh, you know, it, it opened a lot of different doors, um, not only for, for Kyle who won, won the whole thing and his car looked great. Um, but, you know, just through the efforts, uh, you know, through that, you know, it opened a lot of different doors uh, design wise. And, you know, my first start actually, or my first connection with Front Row was through uh, helmet design for David Reagan. That's how I, that's essentially how I, I got the connection there uh, through Front Row. It was years ago, I designed a helmet. And that has been a valuable, that has been a very, very valuable contest that I entered because that opened the door for my relationship with Freight Auctions through that connection. And Freight Auctions, you know, I do a lot of stuff through Freight Auctions now, and they're one of my biggest clients. So. Um, that I, I attribute all that to, you know, entering that contest. And it's as simple as that. You know, if you want to get into the industry, you need to build connections. That's the biggest thing is, is building relationships, building connections, getting your work out there and really promoting yourself. Um, and I wanted to touch on, you know, just real quick, the, the sites like 99 designs, you can go there if you're looking for a logo and get, you know, 15 to 25 to 30 different logos to choose from. And it's super cheap. Uh, versus hiring a professional designer uh, in the field to actually create it for you and work directly with them. Um, if you're looking for just a great looking logo and you don't really care and you just want to select one of 30, then that's fine. But if you want a relationship with, you know, someone you can go to and say, here's, here's what my company is and, you know, uh, here's what I'm looking to do. And, and, and designer will craft that for that company specifically. A lot of the designs that are out there look great, but they don't match their, the company or they're, they're not a good fit. Um, so that, that aspect has kind of cheapened our field a little bit because people are in that mindset that they can go out and get, well, why would I pay X amount of dollars to get this custom design logo from you when I can go out to 99 designs and get it for, you know, really cheap, like under hundred bucks. And, and if that's your mentality, I always say, well then, you know, 99 designs is definitely the route you should take. Because <laughs> if, if you're coming to me with that, then you've already kind of made your mind up, you know, not to sound like a jerk, but that's that that's going to be the route that's going to please them the most because they're looking at it from a bottom dollar and not an end product standpoint. Exactly. So, Emily, I want to touch on a topic with you real quick. Um, you serve as the creative media director over at Truex Management Group. So, Sean made up a good point when it comes to the connections in the field will really get you far, you know. Can you talk a little bit about how Truex management from a creative standpoint, you know, how they make connections and draw in potential clients? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, first thing, I mean, we always try to have a real good personal relationship with everyone. I mean, whether it's you go and get coffee with them, I'm a quick little DM on a social media platform on LinkedIn. I mean, really a little goes a long way and, it's incredible to see all the connections that I personally have made as well as like our drivers and Tony and Brandon over there. Um, the biggest thing that I can say when it comes to making connections is you really just have to get out there and you really have to be, a, a, you have to be social in, in the company, in the sport. You really just have to be social. You have to attend the races. You have to go out there, make sure your face is known, um, speak to everyone and be confident when you speak. Don't question yourself either. You just, you have to really own it and you have to be willing to have a relationship that's going to go further than the little conversations you have here and there. And you have to be able to, you know, keep up with them and ask, you know, what are you doing? Uh, how has this gone? And I think one thing I do and I make, try to make a point to do is any of my drivers or anything, I always check in with them before or after races. 
And I think that goes a long way because, you know, you're showing an interest. You're showing that you actually watched the race. You're showing that you're paying attention to what they're doing and you're having an interest in everything. So it could be the smallest, you know, dirt track driver to, you know, maybe it's someone running late models and it's showing that interest and that passion, what they do, they're going to show an interest and a passion in what you do. And I think as a creative, that's so important because a lot of people think that we just, I mean, we, they think we're printers and <laughs> really, they think that we just like, Hey, can I have this? And you know, two seconds later, it's going to pop out and that's not how it works. And it takes a lot of work and it takes a lot of planning and process and it takes the same amount of work. Well, obviously the drivers have a totally different experience, but, and the teams, I mean, it takes an army for those teams to go to the track every week, but it's me and the drivers and your clients and the people you work around. If you're a freelancer, it's your peers. Um, and I think of that as really your team. And those are the people who you have to look to. Those are the people where, you know, I expect feedback from everyone here and vice versa, having that good relationship where you're honest and open. And I just think that goes a long way. And it's, it's all about the personal connections and just keeping with it. Emily, something else I want to ask you too, you know, you went from a freelance role to a full-time role in a in, in the nascar industry with truex management what are some of the key differences and maybe some of the lessons you learned as a designer and maybe even as a person between freelance work and full-time work so i think when you have a company or an llc or a company that backs you people tend to take you a little bit more seriously which is something that i've learned um, as a freelancer you know you guys all have super professional instagrams you guys have a super professional platform but something I've learned is, you know, you really have to just, it's so tough being a freelancer because you're making connections, but when you have the company behind you, there's also that. Um, and when you have the company behind you, it, there's people coming in and out the door every day. Um, there's people who you're meeting who then you can also meet to another person. But as a freelancer out of college, I was charging roughly like, 35 an hour and I can speak to that because now I'm not freelancing anymore and I chose to take the next step with Truist Management Group because I felt that was going to be a great fit for me. I really wanted to grow up from the ground up and I've been super fortunate to have had that opportunity but once you have those connections and you're able to go further and the more connections and the bigger portfolio, it's all about the portfolio and what you have like behind you and what you've worked on. I hate to say it, but the names, the names are part of the game and you really have to know how to play the game and you have to know how to play the connections. And, you know, like I worked on Florida Georgia line for about three months and I still bring it up when I speak to people because that's a name everyone knows. That's a name that every single person knows. And that's a passion project for me. And it's something that, you know, if you've worked on like a Dale Earnhardt Jr. or something, bring it up. There is no shame. No shame at all, because you know what? People know that, and they can relate to it. Everyone has a good Dale Earnhardt Jr. story. Everyone has a good Dale, Dale Sr. story. Um, yeah, just really be open and play the game. I mean, a lot of times, it's like she said, it's in conversation. It's it's like whether I, you know, it just with the knock-around car that we talked about earlier, you know, I, I went to, to Sean to get some assets because he had designed a Brent Moffat car before. And we both know DC2, and she works with, with DC2 over GMS. So, like, it, all of us somehow, in some way in this industry, it's, it's, you know, that whole six degrees of separation thing. So, you know, meeting a new client, telling them where you've been, what you've done, who you've worked with. They might have worked with them, too. Mm -hmm. Then you have common ground, and then that ball just keeps rolling. Um, you know, the same way with, with anything, with merch design, with, you know, hero cards. There's printers that have worked with these people and that people. And so... You know, knowing more people and, and knowing more more folks around the industry, you can have people that'll back you. You can have people that'll, you know, they might ask somebody, oh, have you worked with Harris before? And then, you know. He's awful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, that also, going, taking it back to pricing, if you're charging a certain amount, then, you know, having that a little bit of notoriety, that little bit of, you know, connection with different people that have used you before, that have worked with you before, 
you know, they might be able to bolster what you're charging going, yeah, he's definitely worth it or, you know, and, and help you grow and, and help you move forward. Well, those connections are valuable too, you know, because, uh, even once you land the job, you now have resources that you've made connections like uh, Greg from Off Axis. I know majority of you guys have already worked with them in the past and he, he's produced, uh, you know, the last two helmets that I've designed uh, indirectly and I went directly to him and was able to work on a, on a project with a client uh, directly just this past week. So, uh, you know, that connection there is valuable for, for my business outside of just what I was doing there because he knows who I am. I know that he paints awesome helmets. And, you know, I can work directly with him and get the job done. The client's going to be happy with it. So it's better for business when you have all these connections, once you even have the business. So the next thing I kind of want to jump in on a little bit is, um, you know, what good pricing points for when you want to start charging for your work. So I know some designers will kind of bring up a deposit up front. So let's throw out a number like $500, for example. You put a number up front, you get a deposit down on a potential uh, client for their work, and then you pay per, and then the, uh, the client can pay per hour. So Harris, I want to start with you and then we'll kind of go around the horn a little bit. You know, from a designer's perspective, what would you say is probably the best way to charge your work, either more per hour or getting a deposit up front and then charging less per hour? I would say, first off, just having knowledge of, a ballpark figure of how long it's going to take you to do something. Um, you know, we, we've been doing this for, for years or however long you've been doing it. You, you have a pretty good idea of how long it's going to take you to make a paint scheme or make a t-shirt design or illustrate a car. Um, so if someone comes to you for one of those things, start with that. Um, say someone comes to me for a truck like this. I can say, you know, that'll probably take me, you know, four to six hours. And then I look at, how much time that is and how much it's going to be worth. And I'll, I'll typically, you know, throw in what my hourly rate is. It's going to be four to six hours at this rate. So you're looking at a ballpark of blank. Um, and so <laughs> you're, you're throwing the math at them. You're telling them what they get. You're like, Hey, I'm going to do this. It's going to take this amount of time for this amount of money. Does that work within your budget? Um, and it's, it's, it differs from project to project. It might be something super intricate. It might be a front and a back with three cars on it or whatever. So you kind of know if it takes you, you know, four to six hours to do one car. If you got to do three cars on the shirt and then do things around it, you can, you can add it up from there and, and kind of lay it all out in front of the client. Um, and that's kind of how I price it. And I mean, I used to be terrible at pricing and she whipped me into shape. Um, <laughs> she's, she's the money brains out of this situation. I, I can go off in la la land and create something crazy, but, when it comes to numbers, I just deal with them all the cars. Like I put the numbers on the cars. I don't, anything else is, is okay. beyond me. But um, she, she kind of whipped me into shape and taught me that little, like, okay, if you did this for this amount of money, how many hours did it take you to divide that? You didn't make anything. I know, mm -hmm. I think it was Ryan that was talking earlier. Like you can look at something and charge for it and think you're getting good money. But if you divide with the time you put into it, you didn't even make minimum wage. Um, so looking at that and looking at, you know, if you spend eight hours on something, that's an entire work day. Whether you pieced it up, you know, over a couple of nights, you worked an entire work day. And if you're getting paid, you know, less than what a work day for you would be worth, you need to, to look at, you know, what you're charging and how long it's taken and kind of reevaluate from there. And there's like, uh, and there's some ways you can do things. Uh, and, and, you know, you kind of do have to uh, learn this along the way. Um, depending on what you do, if it's like a niche thing, like with the, you know, with the designing, with the paint schemes, you know, we kind of have a good idea of how long something like that might take. We do get kind of a, you, you might get that crazy uh, request here and there that you really don't know, um, but you just kind of have to do your best with, with it. But um, some, sometimes, you know, you can either charge by the hour that works good for some people and you can even charge like a set price for some things. If it's, if it's something, you know, you know, it takes, you know, four to six hours, like, like Harris was saying, um, but you can also like mention some things like, you know, you might offer a couple free revisions or like one free revision. And if it goes past that, then you can, you know, decide to start charging by the hour or something like that. Just always make sure that, you know, your time is, is, is getting accounted for um, and things like that. So, it, it, you know, every job is different. Like Harris said, it, you kind of have to be creative, but um, you know, you just kind of see what works best for you. What, what, what you feel is going to, you know, make your time paid for and everything. Definitely agree with the, the revisions thing because sometimes yeah. they can just keep coming back and that's one of the downfalls of, of, a, of a flat rate um, because, you know, I have had clients before that just come back and come back and come back and you, you didn't write that yeah. in. 
beginning, you didn't give them a heads up. So they took that flat rate and ran. Yeah. Um, I think, um, so I used to do like one revision um, and I learned very quickly that wasn't enough. I started with one revision and you know, in different industries, it's different like wedding invitations when I used to do wedding invitations probably three years ago oh my gosh I better put in like five revisions for that. Oh, yeah. we got bridezillas so, like, bridezillas are yeah, real yeah exactly <laughs> they know but glad I'm done with the wedding invites they were fun while they like stay back there but um I found that about two revisions uh when it comes to NASCAR is pretty good um Two revisions for motorsports is usually good. The drivers are usually really good to work with. The teams sometimes are a little bit trickier because everyone has, you know, everything has to be specific. When you're working with a sponsor, I always put in three because the sponsor always has to have their opinion, which I think is important. Their opinion always goes first. It's always for the sponsor. Um, you know, it doesn't, unfortunately, it doesn't really matter if the driver doesn't love it. I never want to put my guys in a car that they don't love or a truck that they don't love. But if the sponsor loves cute green with like purple accents and the gradient, you know? That's what you got to go with. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, it's, I, I found that, you know, I have to tailor, uh, you know, my pricing uh, to the client um, because people are scared of, a, of, a, of an amount that they don't know per hour. You know, is this going to take you 40 hours at this rate or is it going to take you four, you know? And then they're on the hook for, you know, it's hard to budget because everything's budgeted out. They know how much they want to spend. And it's really you trying to figure out what their budget is uh, and what you can give them within that budget. Uh, so the way I find that out is, you know, I'll, I'll offer packages that are, you know, bare bones. I'll, I'll even name it like budget package. You know, when you have the word budget in there, people are like, I'm going to get a deal. And so if that's what they're looking for, they're, they're going to gravitate towards that because it's going to be cheaper. But you, you go ahead and just put the bare bones of what you, you think it's going to take to get that job done for them in there. And then maybe it's one round of revision and one concept, just bare bones. They need something. And usually they're in a rush and they just need something. They're happy with whatever. They're going to go with that and it's going to be good. If they're looking for, you know, one or two concepts, then bump it up to another package, you know, uh, and as you go along as a designer, you figure out these, you know, I need to adjust my packages because I'm spending way more time on this one than I, than I really need to. Or it's taking me way more time or, you know, I can, I can drop this price down and, you know, make it more um, attractive to people. Um, I found that that, that approach uh, really helps you gauge where they're at because they'll come back to you and say, all right, let's, let's aim for package number two or one or three. And that gives you an idea of where they're at budget wise. And, you know, and then you can kind of finesse the pricing and kind of get it worked down from that point. I think it's like, it's really interesting to listen to all of you. Cause uh, since I'm a little newer to the game, I kind of uh, found pricing by trial and error at some points there were sometimes where I would spend so much time on something and realize I literally didn't make anything on it. Um, so um, for me, I, I don't really have a set way of doing things. I, I, it, it's very on a project basis. I, I sometimes do hourly, sometimes do flat rate. Um, a lot of the times the hourly comes in when it's unsure on, on how long I think it's going to take, or um, I can see that there's going to be a lot of revisions. Um, so it, I don't know. I think it's, it's just about being honest with your clients. Um, and, and again, None of us are in the business of ripping anyone off. So uh, doing what is fair for the client and what is going to be best for you, um, it's, it, it can be tricky. But I think, um, you know, never undervaluing your worth and, and your time is pretty much key. And, you know, from there, you, you'll learn. I've learned hard lessons on, you know, when I send my invoice out and realize how much time I actually spent on it, um, kind of is just a wake up call that uh, things need to change a little bit. So the last topic I want to kind of touch on when it comes to pricing is, um, you know, kind of like your skill set when it comes to your prices. So Sean actually raised a pretty good point where he was talking about how he has kind of like packages, like he has a budget package and then he had maybe a higher priced one with more work in it. So, you know, things like rendering, and learning how to produce the rap files. So Sean, I want you to kind of tell me a little bit about when those kind of skill sets, do you kind of take that into effect when it comes to your pricing? 
Yeah, those, I mean, what you offer, the end, the end product, what you, if you offer a render, if you only, your, your base one is only offering, you know, a five point layout, which includes just the wrap files and, and a basic five point for them to post on social, because you'll see those out, out in, in social world. Uh, I'll just include those in the base practice, you know, the, the basic things they need will go in the, in the basic package. Now, when they want to, you know, wow, their, their sponsors or their clients, then bump it up to maybe a render, one render, you know, front and back to showcase on social or, you know, include social graphics as a, as a package and just keep adding value points onto the packages to make it, uh, you know, more valuable to them. Like, oh, I see you get this, this, and this, I'm going to bump up to this package. Um, so that they, they can quantify what they're getting, uh, you know, in each of the packages. That's a, no. that's a point. I mean, when you're, when you're working with somebody and you've got them on the hook for a paint scheme, um, even if they're not interested at the beginning, you know, you can mention to them that like, hey, as this goes, I could do social graphics, we could do launch graphics, we could do IG stories for whatever this is, we can do a render. Um, and you kind of drop those hints, even if they're not interested to begin with, maybe as you go on through the relationship, they come back to you, they realize you can do those things. Um, so, you know, half of it is, is letting people know what you can do and having those extra skills to, to boost the, the value of, of who you are as a designer. Uh, yeah, pretty much everything that like Harris said there is, 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 is spot on. And, and, you know, when, when people can see that you can do the renders, they can see that you can obviously design the schemes and, but, you know, it, it kind of also going off what Sean said, when you can do those wrap files and, and when, you know, sending, sending, those off uh, turnkey uh, and you know learning Adobe Illustrator is, is really important. I feel like that's one thing a lot of designers should should learn. I wish I would have gotten advice like this when I was a lot younger. Uh, but learning Illustrator is key. You know, all wrap files are, are done in Illustrator. Uh, it's vector art. It's not uh, raster art like um, or like uh, Photoshop stuff is. Um, but uh, you know, and, and then you, you, you learn that relationship, you get that relationship with the people that you work with and when they can see that you can do all these different things, it really makes you more valuable to, to everybody like that. And these rap companies, they will punch you in the face. If you send them an iRacing template, I'm just telling you right now, <laughs> don't do it. Uh, I think kind of just to wrap up what everyone was saying there, I, for me, I, um, I do both the 3d and send off for print files. I like to do the 3d for, um, you know, visual purpose on social or um, even just pitches. Um, but with that, uh, I end up doing the scheme twice um, because the 3D renderings are in Photoshop. And then uh, if, if the proposal ends up going through, um, I have to end up putting that into Illustrator. And, uh, you know, I think finding a way to work both of those into your final price is huge just because uh, I think you guys can all speak to it. Um, the, uh, you know, the five point 2d, uh, illustrator file, those can be a pain just cause you have to find Pantone colors. You have to convert, uh, you know, some colors possibly from RGB to CMYK and, and Pantone. And it just be, can become, um, it can become a lot of time and it can become a lot of work. Um, so finding a way to kind of, again, I really like Sean's suggestion of the the packages. You know, you you get um, X, Y, and Z with which is package, and, and um, I think that's one thing that I um, learned along the way, the hard way. Again, is uh, realizing that when you when you do client pitches or just visual um, 3D renderings, that if that's going to be printed again, you can't send that template to a printer. You have to put it in their uh, specific uh, five point and um, everything needs to match up with how it looked in the rendering or vice versa. So it, a lot of time goes into it and you need to charge for every minute of that time. The programs also cost money to, to use. So you got to make sure you cover that. Can't forget about that either. Yeah. You definitely <laughs> got to make sure you cover all the bills. Yeah. Use the smart objects. Use the <laughs> and go with smart illustrator. Use the smart objects. Like that is the <laughs> best friend. Definitely. Funny thing, funny thing for me about Illustrator, the reason that I used Illustrator so much in college, my first print project in college, I used a low-res JPEG for one of the images in my first print spread ever. And my professor 
um, just like pulled me aside after class and was like, if you ever use Photoshop on a print project in this class again, I'm giving you an F. <laughs> So for the rest of my time, I had classes within the rest of my college. I never used anything but Illustrator for any of his projects from then on out. And I was forced to use Illustrator, was forced to learn Illustrator. So I'm very thankful for that. But ooh, I got roasted that first one when it came out all fixed. It was, it was pretty bad. What was the project? It, it was like, it was a magazine layout. And it was about, it was some article of, from PJ Rourke about money or something. And um, I used, I, I did like a little, motif on the Drake so far gone cover with the little kid grabbing the dollars and like I just Classic. put my own spin on it but what I started with was a low res JPEG to like draw over in Photoshop and yeah he, he I got I got roasted I didn't know how to, I didn't know at the time how to re vector it like how to redraw it in vector and after that I really quickly learned how to do vector art Learn the difference between raster and vector as the very first thing you do. Learn the difference between CMYK, RGB, Pantone, learn which Pantone set is the right one. Learn, I mean, those are the basics that, I mean, I guess maybe I went to a tech school. So Same. that was a big focus for me. And talking to him who he went to a very like- Oh, no. oh, oh Ryan, no. we got lost. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> hey, my, you uh, made the man pass cord. out when you're talking about <laughs> Look at that. Ooh, it's a lot, man. It's a lot. To, it's a lot. <laughs> oh gosh, but really, like that's the basics. And do I mean take some tutorials? Uh, Linda.com is great for tutorials. Uh, all of, everyone, if you haven't gone to college for those things and you don't know what a raster or vector is, if you don't know what the difference between CMYK, RGB, those are so important, especially when you're working with people like Dick over at GMS. He does such a good job with putting the rafts in the car and making them look the exact same as your render. And again, those relationships, they come back in because he is phenomenal. And I mean, I can't say enough about some of the people who put the wraps on the cars and, you know, don't necessarily do a great job, but the people that are there watching over and making sure that our designs actually turn out how they're supposed to. Yeah. Yes. Shout out to Dick, also known as DC2. He knows design, he knows wrapping, he knows social media. Like the guy is, is gold. When I sent him the knock around car, it was just a breeze. There was. He knew my language, I knew his language, Language we were able to talk back and forth and the car came out flawless. Um, but, but speaking of that, learn how those 3D cars work, learn how and why the, the five point is a five point. Um, Joe Gibbs Racing puts up a ton of videos of how they wrap their cars. Um, even if you can't get to see one in person somewhere with whoever you're designing with, check those out, see how the vinyl lays, see how it goes around the corners, because um, that'll help you design things and help help you stay away from certain areas that end up being very complicated and, and won't make your final product as good as it should be. And, uh, you know, going off of what Emily was saying there with, you know, look at tutorials or, or um, videos at the same time, uh, the NASCAR, like I've noticed like the design community uh, with, you know, people like, like us or, um, any other designers on Instagram or Twitter or on the, on the discord server or whatever it is, there are so many people that are willing to help. I have sent messages to people so many times on, Hey, I saw you did this. Uh, how did you do that? And a lot of the times, uh, guys are going to help out. Guys are going to push you in the right direction. Guys are going to, you know, give you, uh, some advice on, on how to do things. And, and I think I can probably speak for all of us. If, if there's a designer out there listening right now, like if you shoot us a message, you know, we, we're more than happy to help and we're more than happy to, you know, lead you in the right direction because I think we've all done it to someone else. And, you know, I think uh, the design community is, is really um, one that's very welcoming and helpful and we all want to see each other succeed. We all want to see, um, you know, each other's uh, work out there. Um, we're all rooting for each other. So I think the design community is a huge asset for any any designer, any skill, um, any skill set. So that is um, just a huge, huge resource that I recommend any designer use. I feel like that's something that we all wish we would have had coming up and everything like that. And really just have to thank Michael for really putting that together because it's it's Definitely. been huge and, and great to see everybody just like 
you know, get together and, you know, my phone's popping off a, a lot of the day on discord and sometimes I don't get a chance to get on, but, uh, when I do, everybody's, everybody's, uh, putting up really nice stuff and it's just good to see people just talking and, and communicating and, and being social. Like what Emily was saying, it's just, it's so important to be social. And I think that that's, it's really good to see people, uh, you know, doing that in, in that discord. Yeah. Like, well, it's good that it's working. <laughs> it's, it's great that it's working. Sure. <laughs> it's great. It and is. also, like, that's a good talent pool. For some of us in the industry, that is a great talent pool for us. And that is such a resource for me as I'm looking, you know, just looking at other talent, you know, seeing who's out there. I know someday I might need some help. Not sure when. But that is, Michael, thank you. You made it really hard, though, because there's a lot of them. <laughs> Um, so not sure what I'm going to do. <laughs> Emily had brought up a good point when it comes to wrapping the cart. Um, you know, when we're trying to figure out an episode, you know, we're texting each other all the time, you know, trying to figure out ideas and whatnot. And one of you, forgive me, I can't remember who mentioned that working with the rappers is very important. And especially when it comes to like complex designs to make sure everything lines up. So Harris with the knock around car, you designed it in a way with the large color spots and, you know, Kyle has a love for very complex design. So but between you two and Sean and Ryan and Emily can jump in when they want. Um, how do you go about making sure that, you know, what the work you do in Illustrator, for example, can also make the lives easier of the rappers? So Harris, we'll start with you and then we'll go to Kyle. Well, I, I was presented uh, with Knockaround's branding, um, and they have this new sport line of sunglasses that has the, the rubber pads in and, like, rubber pads back here so when you're running or doing activity, they don't fall off. Um, and they're very vibrant. They're very bright. I think part of the, the branding is also visibility. So if somebody's running, they have these vibrant sunglasses on. It adds to whatever their running gear is. So they had this pattern that goes with it, and that's the pattern that I used for the car. Um, and the pattern was originally made for, you know, tents and, and banners and signs, um, really, you know, flat objects um, with sharp corners and sharp edges. Um, so taking that and adapting it to the car was, was pretty difficult, but knowing around the back of the Xfinity car kind of where those large swashes of color can come back around the rear window and go over, you know, where the A pillar is around to the hood, um, I kept the big spot of yellow on the hood so that when it's going around that front bumper, it's going over where the A pillar is that was an easy connection for the wrappers to make with the big sheet of side vinyl, the big sheet of hood vinyl, um, and then doing them predominantly red on the rear, that allowed the rear bumper to pretty much be all one color and allowed the rear deck lid and just over the haunches and the C pillar to be one color. So those two big trans transformative areas of the car were large swashes of color and I kept all the intricacies down the side um, and once those corners had turned. Um, so the car was a complete wrap, and as you walked around it, all the lines connected, but I used bigger swashes of color and bolder lines to make it look more intricate than it actually was. I, uh, I, give, I give him props for, for that design. That was, uh, that was pretty uh, clever. Everything just pretty seamless. Um, for me, I kind of look at a car as having like uh, like multiple different canvases. Like I look at the side of the car as one canvas, the hood, the rear, the, you know, the top. Um, and I try to, I try to keep in mind uh, that this car is going to be wrapped that, um, you know, what Harris did right there, like that is extremely difficult to do. And chances are, um, you know, if, for me, since I do um, go for more of the complex um, designs that, that is going to be extremely challenging to um, to come out and print. So I like to look at it as, um, you know, I, I want to have the car obviously be as, um, you know, as one design as I can, but I also look at it in separate parts so that there are um, distinct um, areas that, um, you know, go in, in, in certain areas. I, I just, I want to make sure that I'm not a nightmare uh, to work with for, for rappers. And I want to make sure that they don't see my design come through it and their eyes roll and they say, Oh God, here we go again. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think, you know, it, it's, it's having in mind the rappers, it's having in mind the, the fact that, you know, 
when I put this on a five point uh, template, like I need to figure out how I'm going to do that too. So um, there's a lot that goes into it, but I think um, for me, I look at a car in pieces and I look at it um, also within mind the, the fact that someone needs to wrap this and I don't want to completely ruin their day by uh, you know, giving them total headaches on, on where things go. And uh, also to kind of go a little um, to go off of that is, is of course, learning like where, where parts and wraps, uh, you know, come together on the car. But um, also it, it's really important just to really learn the body lines of the car that you're working with, because obviously you can, you know, learn where, where certain parts will match up, but also designing around those body lines or through those body lines or, you know, and everything can really add another just aspect to, to your car design. Uh, it just looks, sometimes they look a lot more natural and, and, uh, but you do have to, you know, sometimes you do have to worry that, uh, you know, things might look cool on a five point, uh, layout. Um, but sometimes they don't account for some of the body lines that are there and you always just have to realize, you just want to make sure that you're not going like over them in like a, a wrong direction or something. Cause that can really throw, throw things off big time, uh, yes. for the finished product and for the, for the wrappers too, even. Definitely. Yeah, for those those quadrants that, that you guys were just talking about, you know, it's key. You know, I, I let I it's tough because you got to work within the the parameters of the car and not make it too difficult for the wrap guys. Like Kyle said, that they're going to hate you constantly if you create this monstrous paint scheme that they're going to have to figure out how to wrap it and make it look good. Um, but having that having that knowledge of you know where those seams are, like Harris Harris said and Ryan said. Um, you know, that, that you can make a really nice paint scheme and, and work those factors into it to make it easier for you and for the wrap guys and ultimately have the car come out how it how you rendered it and how you have it on your five point because that that's key for me. I, I always say go back. What's it set? What's it have on the render? That's how it needs to look. Um, you know, that's what the sponsors approve. That's what NASCAR approved. That's that's what it needs to be. Um, and also having the relationship with the, the, the guys in the shop that are doing the, doing the, the installs. Not all of us know who's doing it or, or we, sometimes we don't see the car until it pops up out, you know, off the hauler uh, when it's being unloaded. Now that's the first time we're seeing it too sometimes. But um, for example, the Corvette parts car last year um, at Darlington, uh, the Crunch throwback, um, I, had, I had a good relationship with the installer who was installing that unit. Um, they received the print files from the print vendor who um, they had print the, uh, the wraps for the car and he was installing it and he was doing it. He, you know, crack a beer, do it late at night, um, you know, when no one's in the shop to, to bug him. And he would send me photos back and forth saying, hey, what do you think about this? And I'd say, well, you know, the front of that car, an original uh, Dale Jarrett car that, you know, that yellow or the, uh, the, the white and the red stripe was up a little bit higher. Uh, you know, on the front splitter. So let's, let's bring that up a little bit. And he go back and kind of reposition it and we, he get it exactly how, how I wanted. Now that's, that's a very rare instance. It didn't happen all the time, but it, that was a very important card that we had to nail that paint scheme and make it exact. So uh, the extra effort um, was put forth because I had a good relationship with that wrap installer where if I hadn't had that relationship, then he might've just threw it on there and just kept going. Um, you know, but he knew who I was, he knew I did the paint scheme. And so, you know, he wanted to make sure that, you know, because he knows me that it turned out the way I wanted it to. So I, I appreciate that of, of him. Uh, he's a good guy. And, um, you know, that's, that's another instance where that those connections and relationships come into play, um, you know, in the final stages of, of your art, which is the, the wrapped car. I mean, that's it. That's your, that's your final piece right there. So before we wrap up, I just want to touch on um, one last topic, uh, specifically for Emily. So Emily, you have put cars on track, and this kind of uh, ties in a little bit to what Sean was talking about with the whole, uh, you know, with the packages when it comes to design work. So uh, you do a lot of also t-shirt work as well. You know, I, I think Harris is wearing one of your shirts right now. Um, it's a very supportive, significant other, by the way. Um, oh, you know, right? the thing I want to ask is when it comes to designing the cars, I mean, specifically with, you know, Ryan Truex, a sponsor, for example, you know, with the t-shirt design, do you guys include that in the TMG, I guess, a sponsor package, or is that more a sponsor or a driver wants it? So it, all in all, it depends. If someone comes to you and says, we need to render a car, um, cool. I personally think that it's really important to show them a whole package and show them every single thing you can offer. 
So I'm a big fan of, you know, the first time I ever put together a pitch deck, I was like, we got to add in like custom earplugs, custom, like, I mean, custom everything. People love their logo slapped on things. It's ridiculous. They're, I mean, who doesn't love that? I mean, Ryan clearly loves his logo slapped on things. There you go. <laughs> hey, I'm like John Ralphio. John Ralphio said that in Parks and Rec. Everyone loves their logo. Yeah, Sean's got it too. <laughs> Kyle's got his hat. Yeah. I mean, people love their logo slapped on things. And I think it's really important to show them what you're capable of doing and, you know, bring their brand to the next level, elevate their experience, um, make it so that the fans have something because ultimately – that's getting their brand out there more. The more people who buy Ryan Truex shirts, you can get yours at shop.markyracing.com. Um, <laughs> the, <laughs> right, um, the more that you get their brand out there and to more people, the more people it touch, it touches, you know, that is the key to a successful partnership. And that is their goal. That's the reason that they're having their logo on the car. And it comes down to the analytics, the numbers, how many people are viewing it. People love numbers. And if you can provide them with sales, and this is how many people roughly saw your shirt, this is how many people bought it at the track, this is how many people bought it online. People love that kind of stuff. And I think that's really important to understand. And creating that package deal, like Sean talked about, that is something that is beautiful. And providing them with the platform to you know, get their logo out there more, Who's going to say no to that? And I think it's just, you have to do it as a designer. It gives you the opportunity to get more clients and, you know, build a better relationship because you're doing more work with them, but it's just so good. It's, there's nothing wrong with it. It's, that's the way to go. hundred percent. Emily, thank you so much for joining us as always. And thank you all again for always pitching in and, you know, you guys are really a good inspiration to the design community. Uh, you know, Kyle made a great point earlier, you know, you all enjoy helping each other out and that means a lot to the young designers. So that's something that I greatly appreciate. So with that being said, thank you all for listening and we'll see you guys in the next one.